Knit can also be used from Roblox Studio directly. So if you don't want to do the external method where you're using Roho with Wally, you can go with this workflow instead just to work within Roblox Studio directly. And so when a release is made with the knit, it also publishes the packages to Roblox right here. And I'll, I'll try to get to this link in a second. And so this will always be up to date with the latest version of knit. So we can just grab this module here and then drag it into Studio. Back to the documentation on the GitHub page. If you go to the documentation link, you'll land on the about page. If you go to getting started, we'll see the different workflows right here. The first one being Roblox Studio and the second being Roho and Wally. In the first tutorial video, we went over the Roho and Wally workflow. Now that tutorial video is probably still going to be really useful to watch in terms of how to use services and controllers and things of that nature. This is just kind of how to get set up using the alternative workflow using Roblox Studio. So again, from here we have the link to knit in the Roblox library. So if you click that, you'll get to here. So just click get or whatever, and then we'll be able to pull in the module within Studio. And as it says, just place it right within replicated storage. So within a place in Roblox Studio, go to the toolbox and get the knit package that you have retrieved. And then it's gonna go into workspace, so just drag it where you want it to be. I'm just gonna put it directly into replicated storage. Now, it's gonna have a lot of things in it, and that's because this is kind of a Wally build that got packaged up. So you really don't have to worry about what's in here other than that knit is right there. And so that's how we're gonna go and retrieve it. So within our code, we'll start in server script service. We'll always have two main scripts that run everything. So we just wanna go and retrieve that. So say knit equals require, and then game get service replicated storage packages dot knit. And then from there we can call knit dot start. And as the other tutorial will go into, this is going to return a promise and all that jazz. So again, I recommend going through that tutorial to get into the very fine details of this, but we'll just set up a, a simple system just to get going here. So then we can do and then, because that returns a promise, and we could just say print knit started. And then if we go and hit run, we should see in the output, it says knit started. So that worked just as expected, that's good, and we're off to the races. Now on the client side, it will look exactly the same there. Now we'll wanna put our client side code under starter player scripts, at least the local script that runs it, and it will look just the same. And we can just say knit started client, and if we hit play here, we'll see knit started client. So everything is working as expected. Okay, and so now if you're going to dive into, again, services and controllers, the other tutorial will go into that in more detail. And so I recommend looking there, but again, just to kind of show how we could do that within Studio, you know, you might have a setup where in server script service, where we put these is really up to you. I might put them in server storage, for instance, and I might have all sorts of things. Maybe I have services here or something. Now, again, in the other tutorial video, I show a different setup in terms of folder structure that is maybe more ideal and more logical, but just to kind of show this off right now, if I create a module script, I'm gonna call it test service just because we're making a test. I'm going to grab some code over here from the server script just to borrow it, just to get knit involved there. And then we can call, we'll, we'll create our test service, knit.create service, and we pass it a name. And then optionally, we could create the client table here. Now, if we didn't do that, it would do it for us, but we can do that. And then we want to return the test service. So right now this doesn't do anything for us, so we have to make it do something. Well, there are a couple of lifecycle methods we can add in, and again, the other tutorial goes into this in more detail, but we can do test service init init, and test service init start. And we can just output some stuff here just to make sure it works. And so we, if we hit run, well, nothing's gonna happen right now. It just says init started, but not our service because we have to load it. Again, this is just a, a module script and that's it. So we just have to require it. And we don't have to do anything with it. We can just say require. And then in this case, it's game.server. We'll do git service. Server storage.services.test service. 
And so we have to require the module, which will then create that service. And there we go, we see test service initialized, test service started, and then knit started. So as you can see within the lifecycle, all of our services will be initialized and start before knit finalizes itself there. And so by the time we get to this code within knit start, we know that our services are ready to go. Now, if we had another service, let's, let's just duplicate this and we'll call it literally another service. We'll open that up and we'll just change the names around here. And then within our service script, we need to require that module. Now we have two services. And as you'll see here, they're both initialized before they're started. And that's a really key point in terms of the life cycle of services and controllers on the client side is that their life cycles will always go through all the initialization code before it gets to start. So that means if one of these waits a few seconds, it's going to wait until they're done until it gets to the start. So for instance, if I do test service and here I add task.wait3, what we're gonna see is that we see that they initialize because it'll, it'll print these right away, but then it'll wait three seconds until we see anything start. So we hit run, we see they initialized, no start yet, and then they start. So there we go. And so anytime we have anything that needs to initialize to get our service ready before other things use it, we should put it within initialize because we can then go and talk to other services. So for instance, my test service, maybe I write my own method here, which we can do. Maybe it says do something, I don't know. Maybe we'll add, add one. So we'll give it a number and we'll return a number. And we're just gonna return in plus one. Okay, simple enough. So how do I call this? Well, in another service, I can go grab that and I can say knit dot services, or sorry, knit git service, test service. And so that will give me a reference to this service here. And then I can add one. So I'll, I'll give it 10 and it should spit back 11, 10 plus one. I'll say 10 plus one equals 10 plus one. And we'll run it and we'll see 10 plus one equals 11. And so that worked. Now I could also put this code in init and it would currently work. It's, it works 10 plus one equals 11, but this is highly not recommended. And the reason for this again is our test service, we don't know if it's initialized yet. Now that works fine now because this method only, it, it's very functional in nature. It, it only cares about its inputs uh, within the arguments. But if for whatever reason, our method here had to deal with something within this service that's not set up yet, maybe there's a part that's created or a model that's positioned, well, we don't want anyone calling this yet because we haven't set that up in our initialized state here yet. And so you, you have a race condition where it may or may not be initialized and that's no good. And so that's why we have knit start here so that we know that once we get to our start methods, we know that any service that we use within it has already been initialized and is safe to use. That's the assumption we can make assuming we use the initialization state to actually set up our services. Now again, a lot of times you might not need to set them up to do anything and that's okay. And you can actually leave these functions blank or not even there. You can take them out and it'll work just fine. And so that are services and stuff. And so there's also a helpful way to load these faster. So right now we're doing a require on each one. We could also just do knit dot add services and then pass in that services folder as such. And that's just gonna go through all the children of that folder and require the modules and that's it. And it still works and that's fine. Now, again, if you split up your services into different folders, you're gonna to have to load them in your own way. But again, it's just a matter of requiring the modules and that's it. Okay, and so on the client side, it's essentially the same thing. So on the client, we would do something like knit.addcontrollers, and then we'd pass a folder. So maybe that game gets service, replicated storage, and maybe I have controllers there or something of that nature. And controllers look very similar. So I'm just gonna call on my controller. Controllers are basically the exact same thing as services, but they're client side. All right, so on 
I'm just going to grab some code here again for getting knit. So I just do knit.create controller. And then you just need to give it a name. I highly recommend always matching the name with the name of the module. Same with the variable name here. And then we return it. And controllers have the same lifecycle methods as services. So I can do knit init and start just like that. And again, I can say print script.name initialized started. Okay, and if I run, if I hit play here, we should see that, yep, my controller initialized and started, and so that worked just as expected. Now that's cool, and controllers can also talk to each other the same way services can, right? I can do get service to get services. On a controller, I can do knit.getController to get other controllers. But one really powerful thing is controllers, and really anywhere on the client that has knit, can also call out knit get service. So I can actually get a server side service and access it in certain ways. And that's where this client table comes into play. Let's go to test service again. And let's say I wanna make this add one function. I wanna add it on the client instead. And so over in another service, let's just get rid of the code that was calling it first. And then in test service, all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say dot client. And then the first argument is gonna be the player. And just like that, what we've done is we've created a remote communication layer where our client can now call out to this test service and call this method. So if I go over to my controller, I can say init get service test service, and then I can call test service add one. And again, let's add, let's add one to 15. And then I can print that out. And then if I hit play here, it won't work. And the reason this won't work is because knit returns promises for their methods. And so this is gonna be a big kind of gotcha for a lot of people that are using knit within the, the later versions is by default, knit is actually gonna return promises when you call out the services from the client. And so instead of doing this right here, what we'd have to do is, well, let me stop it here. I'm gonna comment these two lines out. I would instead do test service add one 15 and that's going to return a promise so i could do and then and then i could get the value and then i could print it out here so now if i run it we'll see 15 plus 1 equals 16. so that works fine now a lot of people don't really want this they'd rather have the code yield right there and so if you want this to work we have to configure knit to do that and so if we go back to the documentation and we go to the api here we go to knit client We'll go to start. We'll see that we can pass in some options to knit. So if we click on knit options, what are the options here? Well, that went to the server, so that wasn't helpful. Here we go, knit options. So we have service promises, and we can set this as a Boolean, true or false. Now it defaults to true. And so if we want it to not return promises and just work like we might expect it by default, we need to return, or we need to set this to false. So it's service promises, so I'll copy that. Go back to studio, go back to your client code that starts knit. And right here, we're gonna add a table, and this is where we're gonna configure knit. So I'm just gonna say service promises equals false. Now if I do that, then in my controller, I should be able to do this just fine, and it's not gonna return a promise anymore. Instead, it's going to yield at this point until that request comes back. So I hit, hit play here. We'll see 15 plus one equals 16, so it worked just as expected. Whether you wanna use promises or not is up to you. Okay, so what is actually happening here? So if I hit play or run here, I just wanna look at what's actually happening under the hood so people understand the magic behind this. So if I go to replicated storage and I go to packages and knit, I can go to services. And then if I look in services, I'm gonna see these communication modules. So for instance, in test service, I can see my add one remote function. And so under the hood, when we add things, add methods to our client table on our services, it's going to automatically create these remote functions and those are gonna let our client communicate with that service. So that's pretty useful. Now we can also do events or signals. So we'll go to our test service and our client here, I can say some signal equals knit.create signal. So if I hit play again, and now I go back to that structure. I'm gonna see some signal here is a remote event. 
And so now I can fire that event whenever I want. So maybe every, I don't know, one second I'll fire it with a number. And I'll do self.clients.sumsignal fire all in. So it's going to fire all clients with that number. And so on my My Controller, I can then bind to that. So again, that was a test service. So within the test service, again, I can do test service dot sum signal connect. I get my number and I can just print it out. And if I hit run or play here, we'll see it starts printing the numbers as they come through. Now my client can also call back to it. So I could do test service dot sum signal fire hello from clients. And that would work just as well. So if I go to a test service again, I can listen to that. I can do that within start or init in this case. So I can do self.client.sumsignalConnect. And it's going to pass the player as the first argument and then what other, whatever else was sent along. In this case, I'm just sending a single message. So I can say print player.name says message. Hit play. There we go. Slightnik says, hello from clients. So that's working just as expected. Now a controller cannot fire a function, or I'm sorry, the other way around, a, a service cannot fire a function on the client and that's by design, that should never happen. Um, instead, you should always communicate with signals if you need two-way communication. Otherwise, if you, the client needs something from the service, then they can call one of the methods that you expose. One other gotcha I want to cover with this really quick is if we're in a client method like this and we want to call another method, so maybe we have a test service add and we just have two generic things and we just re return it, right? So what if we want to use this method to implement this? So a lot another gotcha is some people will do self add, in this case be one and n. The reason that doesn't work is because self in this case is client. That's what the self keyword would refer to in this case and that's not ideal. And so we need to refer back to the test service. And so knit helps out with this and it injects a dot server reference within the client table which will reference back up to the service. So I can do self dot server and then I can access add. So again if I run We'll see the number 15 plus one equals 16. So it worked just as expected. Okay, so that covers, I think, just about everything. Again, the other tutorial will be most useful for the rest of understanding how to use knit, but hopefully this is a helpful kind of get, getting started point for using it within Roblox Studio.